Okay, <clears throat> let's get started. Uh, today I want to continue our discussion that we started uh, yesterday. So we'll continue pursuing this probabilistic perspective uh, on machine learning. Right, as a reminder, throughout this course, we've taken this very much optimization-based point of view, right, looked both at supervised and unsupervised learning in terms of optimizing over a family of functions that we would then use in order to make predictions, right? And the way we would do it, it we would specify a loss function and then try to optimize that loss function on uh, our training set with the hope that by doing so, we get good prediction on the test set. Okay, and what you want to understand in this uh, following set of lectures is what explicitly are we assuming about our data when, say, choosing a particular kind of loss function, right? Moreover, what kind of assumptions you're explicitly making if you choose a particular regularizer, right? And these assumptions will be very useful in assessing whether particular models might actually be useful when applying them to certain problems. Um, and if they're not, uh, then maybe they offer alternatives that you might want to consider. Okay, and so again, um, we started our discussion in the context of uh, least squares regression, which we'll continue to do today, and then we'll move on uh, to talk about classification later. Okay, so just as a reminder, we started off with this question that um, we wanted to understand what is the optimal hypothesis, right? the optimal predictor that we could be using uh, for a given family of, uh, of learning problems, right? And in order to turn this into a well-defined uh, question, we have to define our notion of successful learning, right? And uh, we basically use this perspective that we've already introduced a few lectures ago, namely this ID assumption, right? That our uh, examples are drawn independently, identically distributed from some unknown uh, distribution P of X comma Y, okay? So this is our general learning setting that we've been uh, looking at throughout this, uh, this lecture. And we can ask under this setting, what's the best we can possibly do? Okay, and if you want to know what's the best we can possibly do, it's actually useful to think about what we might be able to do if we knew uh, truly the data generating distribution, right? Which we, of course, don't know in practice, right? We can ask what happened if we knew P of X comma Y. And what we've derived yesterday is basically that if we care about the square loss, then what we should do is we essentially should estimate uh, conditional distributions, namely the conditional distribution um, over uh, y given, uh, given x, and then just predict the mean of that conditional distribution. Right? So this gives us a function h star, which generally non-linearly depends, depends on our input x, and this is really the optimal uh, optimal solution, right, that would minimize our prediction error under this model of learning, right? And of course, in general, we will not know P, uh, P of X comma Y, right? But this perspective gives us a recipe of what we might want to do, namely try to estimate these conditional distributions, right? And so what, what does this concretely mean? Well, now we have to consider a family of models for these conditional distributions, and typically we would look at parametric models, and then we would try to fit their parameters. And the most basic, uh, right, so, so we would uh, sort of, as our strategy, try to estimate essentially a family of conditional distributions of y given x. And then once we have estimated uh, those, we can make use of this conditional distribution in order to turn it into a concrete prediction, right? And in this case, what you might want to do is just to predict the mean. Okay, and of course the question is how do we go about estimating uh, such distributions, right? Uh, so that means we have to uh, look at different families of estimators and what we, uh, sort of the, mo the most basic one uh, to, to look at is maximum likelihood estimation, right? So we can basically try to find among our family of parameterized conditional distributions of y given x, what's the one that maximizes the likelihood of our observed labels uh, given uh, the inputs x and the parameters under consideration theta, 
right? So this now essentially yields an optimization problem that comes out of this uh, probabilistic assumption that we're making about our data. And now what you have to specify is what family of conditional distributions do we want to pick, right? And so what we um, looked at as a concrete possibility uh, yesterday is to look at the conditional uh, linear Gaussian model. We basically model the label as a Gaussian with a fixed variance, so fixed independently of the input, with mean that does depend on the input, namely in a linear manner. Right? That's the modeling assumption that we uh, made yesterday. Right? We basically assume that yi is uh, drawn from a normal distribution with mean uh, w transpose xi and uh, variance sigma squared, right? which is equivalent to assuming that yi uh, is just w transpose xi plus epsilon i, where epsilon i is a normal distribution with mean zero and variance sigma squared. All right? So basically, we, it's sort of a linear function of the input plus Gaussian noise. So this is a particular assumption we could be making about how our labels are being generated. And if you make that particular assumption and then apply maximum likelihood estimation, then what you arrived at the end of yesterday's lecture is what we get as least squares. Right? So if you work out under this ID assumption, right, what is the set of parameters, which in this case is the linear function, right, our weights W, that maximize the conditional likelihood of our labels, given the inputs and the model parameters, then solving this problem is equivalent, formally, to solving this least squares problem, right? To optimizing over all linear functions with weights W uh, uh, for the one that minimizes the square loss, right? And this comes out of the fact that if you look at this posterior class probability, right, of y given x, uh, so, so the conditional class probability of y given x and w, and take the log of that, then because of the independence assumption that probability factorizes, if you take the log of that product, we get the sum of the logs, right? And that yields an optimization problem where we basically optimize over a sum of cost functions, one per each term, and there's a bunch of things that really don't depend on w, that don't matter for sake of optimization, and uh, as a consequence, we just uh, get this d squares problem, right? So what does this concretely mean? Well, it means that we now have an interpretation of what you're basically doing when trying to solve the least squares problem, right? When basically solving this least squares problem, that we're implicitly making the assumption, first of all, that we essentially have um, the, uh, so, so, so that we, are, of course, our data is, uh, is independently uh, distributed, right? Drawn from the same distribution, and that our labels um, are perturbed by Gaussian noise with a fixed variance. Right? So this is the assumption we're implicitly making. And now we can ask, is this a good assumption? Right? We can look at our data and see maybe it doesn't really look like Gaussian noise, and if it's not Gaussian noise, we might plug in some different kind of likelihood function. Right? That's sort of the, the starting point where this is useful. Okay, and this actually holds more general, not just holds for, for linear models, right, but for, uh, in general, one linear functions as well. So if you were to look at the family of neural nets, right, say uh, uh, neural nets with two hidden layers, right, and a certain number of units per layer, and you optimize the square loss, you're basically making a Gaussian assumption on your data, right? You assume your labels are Gaussian with variance constant across the inputs. Okay, so these are equivalent, right? So choosing this optimization problem makes a certain assumption of about the data. If this assumption is good, maybe that's a good cost function to use. If the assumption is not good, maybe it's not the right cost function to use. Okay. <clears throat> uh, good. And now, one thing we haven't talked about yet is why maximum likelihood estimation. Right? So in principle, we could use other estimation techniques to try to estimate the parameters of this conditional distribution. Right? So there's two completely separate things. Right? What model do we use for conditional probability, such as conditional linear Gaussian, right? Gaussian noise? And what estimator do we use in order to obtain our weights? Right? And depending on which estimator we get, we end up with a different optimization problem. Okay, so what you talked about is maximum likelihood estimation, and there's good, use, good reasons of why you might want to look at maximum likelihood estimation. 
right? So here's the standard statistical arguments that we'll not formally define and go into detail uh, in this class, right? But the maximum likelihood estimate uh, satisfies several uh, nice statistical properties, such as uh, consistency. So you can ask, for example, um, in the limit of infinite data, if my assumptions were really satisfied, right? So the conditional distribution is, in fact, the Gaussian distribution, right? So Gaussian noise. Then do I recover the true parameters? Right? That's the question of efficiency. Uh, sorry, that's the question of consistency, right? I, do I consistently recover the correct parameters? At least in the limit of infinite data, right? A maximum likelihood estimate uh, satisfies this. Um, but not only consistency, there's other consistent estimators as well. Um, it's, uh, it's also an efficient estimator, okay? And so it's in particular, uh, it's asym asymptotically efficient, which um, is a technical statement that are not formally defined, basically means that uh, it has smallest variance among um, the whole family of quote-unquote well-behaved estimators. Again, it's a statement about, about large data, and we'll talk a bit more about sort of variance of estimators going forward. But basically the idea is that since my data is random, if I estimate the parameters from my data set, right, I'm subject to the random fluctuations that are inherent in my data. Right? If I had, had seen a different realization of my training set, I would have gotten a different model. Right? Hence, that, hence, that means there's variance in the estimate of, of the model that I would use. And I can ask how much variance is there. Right? And different kinds of estimators might give different amount of variance. Okay? And the maximum likelihood estimate is asymptotically efficient. So in the limit of infinite data, it basically has the smallest variance among sort of well-behaved estimators that are not talking about more about. And moreover, you can sort of study the limiting distribution, again, in the limit of infinite data, sort of, how, so, uh, so basically how, what happens with the distribution over my parameter estimates. Right, so it's asymptotically normally distributed. Okay, now one thing that's very important about all these statements, they're super nice, but the issue with them is that they're all asymptotic. So meaning all in the limit of infinite data. And so everyone talks about big data, big doesn't mean infinite, right? And so what we've talked about all through this class is if you have a lot of data, you might also want to look at complicated models, right, with lots of parameters. And so all sort of the... The, the empirical successes of deep learning right, are really attributed of, at looking at very complicated hypothesis classes, right? neural nets with lots and lots of parameters. Right? And you might look at models where the number of parameters is much larger than the number of data points, right? or in the same order. So it means that if you use these kind of techniques, you're never in this asymptotic regime. Okay, so that's an important, uh, important remark here. Right? And so one of the consequences of this is overfitting, as we had talked about before. And I want to go back to our overfitting discussion in light of this discussion here, in light of this question of sort of what families of, uh, of models, um, how, they, how they respond to random fluctuations in the data. And I want to discuss an extremely important notion that relates to overfitting that's called the bias variance trade-off. Okay, and so this is a notion that um, is super clean to discuss in the context of least squares, right? So, or maximum likelihood estimation in the context of Gaussian models, okay? And it's basically the following equation, which says that, and I'll formally define this in, in the subsequent slides, but this is sort of the high-level uh, intuition first. I can look at my prediction error, right? The risk of my prediction, right? So again, what is this? I have my data, I estimate a model, say a weight vector w hat, and now I look at the prediction error of that randomly estimated quantity on test instances I haven't seen. Right? That's my prediction error, what I really care about. And it turns out that this can be decomposed into three terms that are very important to understand and I want to elaborate on. Okay, so the first is the bias, or for technical reasons, bias squared. Um, then the variance and then the noise. So what do those mean? And I'll formally define them in the following slides. Uh, so bias is basically a contribution to the prediction error that I incur by using a restricted family of models. Right? See the, 
the best predictor h star is actually nonlinear, but I restrict myself to linear models. Right? Then that means that I'll always make some prediction errors because I'll not be able to perfectly match h star. Right? That's some intrinsic error I get by, by limiting the families of functions I consider. That's the bias. Okay, so the bias does not depend on the number of data points observed. It depends on the choice I make about the model, right? Whether say I use linear functions or neural nets with one hidden layer, or you neural nets with two hidden layers or kernels or whatever, right? So the choice of hypothesis of family of functions will lead to certain bias in the estimation. Okay? So that's the first quantity. Right? Now the second quantity is variance. So this relates to this uh, issue we just discussed, right? So the fact that our data set itself is random, right? So there's this unknown distribution P that we sample from, and we only get to see n random draws, right? And if I had drawn multiple training data sets of the same size, they would be different, right? Because each example is drawn randomly from the distribution. That means for each of these random data sets that I've drawn, I would have fit the different linear model. Right, that would have fit a different neural net, right, a different function h. Okay? h hat. Okay? And now that means that since I have finite data only, so I don't have infinite data, relating to the previous slide, right? So when you have finite data, there's, my var there's a variance in my predictor. Right? And um, that will contribute to this prediction error. Right? So that's what I suffer from because the, the uh, training data set fluctuates statistically. Okay? And the third term is the noise. That's basically the amount of prediction error that is irreducible, right? That even H star, the space optimal predictor that we had talked about, would incur, right? Even if you knew the true class conditional distribution of Y given X, and you would predict the mean, which is the optimal thing to do in terms of squared error, you would incur some error, right? Because nature might not be deterministic, right? For the same x, nature might give you different y's. Okay, and if you just use a function for making predictions, there's always going to be some error, which depends on the amount of, of variance and certainty in this conditional distribution. Okay? And so, uh, basically, the prediction error decomposes into these, into these three different terms. Okay? And now those can be nicely uh, quantified right, in the context of, of least squares. So let me just discuss those. So what is, uh, what is bias? Right? Again, um, the, um, So, um, right, so basically, one second. Um, yeah, so, so, so H, so, so basically the bias um, is uh, due to the fact that um, you have a um, limited hypothesis class that you're considering, right? You're optimizing over H, which might, might or might not uh, include H star, right? And that means uh, that your estimator will, um, uh, will not be the same as H star, right? Because you have this, uh, this random data set, right? And so essentially the discrepancy between the expected uh, prediction error that your estimator H would obtain when trained on your random data set D and the prediction that H star, the space optimal classifier, would make, this is given by this quantity here, that's the bias, and bias can be positive and negative, right? You can be overestimate or underestimate H star. So that's why we look at bias squared, right? So we take the difference between these quantities, right? So this would be the expected prediction of your hypothesis estimated on this random data set D. You compare that against the prediction that the optimal um, hypothesis uh, would be making, H star, right? And you square that difference, right? So that gives you something that's always greater than or equal to zero, 
That would be exactly zero if and only if, uh, basically, this expectation over the prediction you get by using a method agrees with H star. Okay? So that's the, uh, that's the bias in the estimation. Now, the variance in the estimation stems from the fact that um, for a particular random realization of your data set, your prediction might vary, might differ from the expectation of your predictor, that uh, the, sort of the expected prediction you would get on a randomly drawn data set, right? So this here basically, so this is the same quantity that we had before, right? Uh, so this essentially, um, so, so the, way, the way to think about this, right? So let's maybe just elaborate on this here a little bit, right? So, so D is drawn randomly from this distribution P, right? You see random training data set. Okay, now for a given random training data set, you fit, say, a linear function, fit a linear model, right? And now you can ask for a given X, what would be the prediction I get, right? And now I can look at the fluctuation of this prediction, and take the mean of that, right? That's what this quantity says, right? So I take the expectation over how the training data set might possibly look like of what I would predict on that randomly drawn data set. So this is not a random, uh, so, so this quantity is a deterministic function of x, right? And now you just take the expectation with respect to that x. Okay? So that's sort of the average linear model that you would fit, for example. Okay, so that's basically what this quantity means, right? So the average linear model, and this is sort of the nonlinear base optimal predictor H star. Okay, now the variance is given by this term, right? So now you look at the actual realization, right, of that random linear model, and you compare its prediction with the average prediction, right, which is this quantity here, right, that we had on the previous slide. Look, the, the, basically the variance of that prediction. And again, that's averaged over uh, the, um, the uh, a point in which you evaluate. Okay, so that's the variance in the prediction. Right, this comes from the fact that you randomly estimate the hypothesis. And the last is the noise, right? And this noise basically does not at all depend on your hypothesis. Right? Depends not at all on the fact whether you use a linear model in your net or whatever, right? So this is basically just expectation over x, y drawn from p of um, y minus h star of x, right? So that's basically the, uh, the risk incurred by the minimum risk predictor, right? By the base optimal predictor h star. Okay, so this does not depend on whatever learning algorithm you use. This is just inherently sort of the randomness in the learning problem. Okay, so this is the formal definition of these three terms here just on one slide. And uh, it turns out that they just add up exactly to the prediction error, right? So this here is the, uh, is the uh, true risk, right? So the, the prediction error. Right? So which is an expectation over the random training data set, an expectation of a randomly drawn test point of the difference between the test label minus your predicted label when having trained on this random training data set, right? That's your average prediction error, taking all the randomness into account, right? The randomness due to training and the randomness in the test instance. Okay, and this decomposes as a sum of these three terms. And I'll not go through this derivation, but that can be formally shown in the least squares case. Okay, so it decomposes into uh, the uh, bias squared, right? So this here is the bias plus uh, the variance plus the noise. Okay? Now, why is this useful? Well, this now lets us study the effect of choosing different hypothesis classes, right? And sort of 
looking at the consequence of, for example, using certain family of estimators. Okay, so let me illustrate this. And to illustrate this, let me actually show, okay, let's, let's do the following. Let me show the demo. So this is what, what we had discussed quite a bit in earlier lectures, right? Which is the, uh, our fitting polynomials example. Okay, and so let's look at, um, right, so this is this, this familiar, uh, familiar setting, right? So the true hypothesis is really um, the data drawn uh, essentially by evaluating a polynomial of a certain degree and adding Gaussian noise. Okay, so these points are just our, our training example, and now we can fit models of increasing complexity, right? Degree one, uh, degree two, uh, degree, uh, and uh, always higher degrees, right? And so here, if there's no noise, right, then sort of very quickly you sort of capture uh, the true function, right? And you don't really overfit, right? Because essentially there's no way to overfit to the noise. Okay, but of course the problem is that in practice there is noise, right? So it means that now if we look at increasingly more and more complex hypotheses, uh, we see overfitting going on, right? And especially get this getting worse if we have uh, less and less examples, right? That's sort of the, the familiar uh, examples that you had seen before. Okay, All right, so this is, so what does bias, variance, et cetera, um, have to do with this, right? So uh, we, here we consider different families of hypothesis, H, namely polynomials of increasing degree, right? And as we go from simpler model, namely sort of constant, um, to sort of polynomials of increasingly larger degree, we decrease the bias, right? We capture more and more complex functions, and eventually if you use a large enough hypothesis class, Right, the degree is equal to the number of data points, we can perfectly interpolate. Right, we can fit any, uh, any such function. Right? Um, now at the same time, we have, uh, we have variance. Right? So if we uh, draw a new data set, we get to see new realizations um, of, our, of our polynomial. Right? And of course there's the noise here which, um, which, which is uh, really unavoidable. Okay, so let's do a little illustration here, right? So how does this look? So here is our model complexity. So on this side, we would sort of, we look at simple models, right? Say uh, polynomials. Um, of low degree. Right? And here, sort of, they get increasingly more complex. Right? So high degree. And now we can sort of plot how these three curves, namely bias, variance, and noise, um, would uh, change over this uh, function, uh, the family of functions. Right? Uh, so what happens with the, uh, with the bias? Well, if you use very simple models, then uh, the bias is going to be large because we don't really capture the data well, right? But as we increase the degree, the, uh, the bias is decreasing more and more, right? In fact, we'll go to zero in this example that we had, right? So this might really go to, uh, to zero. Okay, so this is the, the bias. Now the variance, what happens with the variance as we increase the model complexity? If you use very simple models, right? The constant, right? So the all zero polynomial, it's the same no matter what's our data, right? It has zero variance. As, but as we use more and more complex polynomials, the variance goes up, right? So the variance will go up like this. Okay? But then, of course, we also have the, uh, the noise. And how does the noise depend on the model complexity? Not at all, right? So the noise is just staying constant. So that's the noise. And what we're saying is that the prediction error is just the sum of those three, right? So the prediction error is going to look something like, like this, right? So that would be our prediction error, right? And of course, ideally, we want to sort of 
uh, um, find this point that minimizes the prediction error. Okay, so that's concretely this decomposition. So just a simple example of this, if you go back to this demo here, right? Um, so this is um, essentially using the same fits as, as in this uh, previous demo that I showed you ab above, right? Now what you can do is we can look at how does the uh, prediction error on a validation set decrease or change as we vary the polynomial degree, okay? And so this is what you said if the, uh, if, so the true data was generated from a degree four polynomial, or degree five polynomial, I think. And so here, essentially, if we, uh, so for zero noise, right, if we choose our degree large enough, we get zero error, and it actually doesn't increase, right? So if there's no noise in the data, we don't really see overfitting. But of course, as noise increases, right, the, uh, the prediction error is actually going to go up, right? So these are concrete realizations of this uh, cartoon that I've drawn uh, on the previous slide, right? Now, as you vary the amount of noise. Okay, and now as we keep increasing the, the noise, right, it'll actually be more and more attractive to pick simpler and simpler models, right? I think if I grow, increase up to n, right, even the um, more, more degree two, right, the simpler model, right, that doesn't really uh, contain the two data generating polynomial will actually have uh, lowest uh, mean squared error. Okay? Good. <laughs> so that's basically this, uh, this demo. And now what's the lesson, right? Um, well, so we said maximum likelihood estimation is unbiased. So that's actually some, something one can show, right? So maximum likelihood estimation, um, in fact, will have, uh, will this quantity, so this quantity is going to be zero as long as our hypothesis class actually does contain H star. Okay, so basically, in this case of the polynomials, right, if the data was really generated by, say, a degree five polynomial, as long as we um, consider families of polynomials of degree five or larger, on average, uh, their prediction is actually going to agree with H star. Okay, so basically, maximum likelihood estimation uh, is, is unbiased. Okay? But now, of course, we've seen, right, that it's not only the bias that matters, but variance as well, right? And so uh, the main lesson uh, from this plot here, right, and our discussions about overfitting is that it can actually be a good idea to trade a bit of um, bias at the gain of dramatically reduced variance, okay? That's sort of the key idea, right? And the key reason why maximum likelihood estimation might not actually be the best estimator to use, right? So it might actually make sense to use something different for maximum likelihood estimation if you care about uh, minimizing your prediction error, right? Because of the fact that you don't operate in this asymptotic regime, right? You have finite amount of data. You not just care about the bias, but you also care about the variance in the prediction. Yeah. So I would argue that this is a very rare circumstance, right? Where you're basically saying where there really is no noise, right? So no bias. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. Not exactly clear what you. So I'm not sure I understood your question. Um, maybe we can take it, discuss it, discuss it during the break. So, okay. But that's basically the idea, right? And so that's sort of reconciling the facts, right, that least squares, maybe it's not the right thing to do for polynomials, right? That's why we discuss things like the lasso or uh, ridge regression and these sort of things, right? But now we can ask, 
if you use something like rich regression, right, or something like the lasso, does this mean that we are now starting to make certain assumptions about our data, right, or our model, right? Similarly to the fact that if you use the Gaussian, if you use the squared loss, we implicitly assume our noise is Gaussian, right? Is there sort of a similar interpretation of what, say, rich regression or lasso might do from this perspective of probabilistic modeling? Right, that's a natural question that one can, uh, can ask. And it turns out the answer is yes. And so basically what one can show is that um, so sim similarly there sort of the square loss corresponds to assuming a Gaussian likelihood going from least squares to rich regression to adding regularizers is going from maximum likelihood estimation to Bayesian estimation. Okay, and I just want to uh, discuss this, discuss this argument. So you can basically interpret regularization in terms of using a particular kind of prior on the models that you're considering. Okay? Now, what do I mean? Uh, so what does it mean to make prior assumptions? Well, um, so let's discuss again uh, linear regression. And so what's the natural assumption that we could make? Well, we could sort of make an, a, a Bayesian prior assumption on our weights. Okay? In particular, let's just assume a priori, without having seen any data, that our weights are Gaussian distributed. Okay, so let's assume that our weights are drawn from a Gaussian distribution centered at zero um, with per weight variance beta squared. Okay, so basically each, um, each wi is drawn from a normal distribution at, seen at zero um, with variance beta squared, uh, all independently of each other. Okay, now that's a prior assumption, which basically says that a priori I believe my weights are small. If I haven't seen any data, I think my weights are small, right? Maybe my data can, be convinced, can convince me otherwise, right? But a priori, that's my assumption. And now under this assumption, what you can do is you can try to uh, now calculate the posterior distribution of our weights by applying Bayes' rule, right? So how would this go? Well, um, we want to go from prior distribution, P of W, to the posterior distribution of W given x1 through n and y1 through n, right? So this you want to compute. Um, and so how can you do this? Well, we can apply Bayes' rule. And in particular, what you're going to do is you apply Bayes' rule to the conditional distribution, so condition on our data, OK? So what this basically means is that now we get P of W given 1 through N. Let me just write this out. Um, and P of Y1 through N given X1 through N and W divided by probability of Y1 through N given X1 through N, right? So essentially, we apply apply base rule to uh, the conditional distribution conditional distributions given x. Okay? So this is basically just literally applying a uh, base rule. Right? You get this, this expression. Right? Our posterior is, is proportional to prior times the likelihood. That's the normalizer. Um, now, one thing I want to mention here is this here now says it's the, the distribution of W given x1 through xn. So what's, now we somehow have to talk about what's our prior distribution over W given x1 through xn. Right, so in principle, we could consider our prior distributions that depend on our data, and sometimes one actually does this. But we'll just here assume that our weights are independent of not just the y's, but also the x's. Okay? So, so this means that this is just uh, the, the distribution over W 
times property of y1 through n, given x1 through n, and w, divided by y1 through n, given x1 through n, right? And this here is, let's just, um, assuming W is independent of, of X, right? That's really not the major assumption, right? So basically, so P of W is the same as P of W given X1 through N. Okay? So that's just base rule. And now under base rule, we can ask, well, now I start with my assumption that the weights are Gaussian. And now I get to see some data. Right now, what's the set of parameters that are most likely under the posterior? Right? So you can try to work that, um, work that out. And actually, this takes a little while to, to do this derivation. So what I would suggest is that we actually take uh, the break now. And then after the break, we'll work out what is this um, what, what is basically the set of parameters that are most likely a, priori, a posteriori. Okay, <clears throat> let's continue. So we've discussed the bias variance trade-off, right? And we've discussed how um, it can actually be very useful to go away from unbiased estimators, like maximum likelihood estimation, by allowing a little bit of bias and consequently dramatically reducing the variance. And that's the key idea behind um, regularization, as we had discussed earlier. And what I want to do now, right, is we want to, similarly to giving a probabilistic interpretation of the loss function, also give a probabilistic interpretation to regularization. Okay, and so the way we do this is through Bayesian modeling, right? Uh, so instead of purely maximizing the likelihood of our data, we now actually make some assumptions about our model, right? And we make these assumptions using a Bayesian perspective, right? By placing a prior distribution on our weights. And what we're doing here concretely is we place a Gaussian distribution on our weights. Um, and now what we're going to do is we are going to calculate the posterior distribution of our weights by just applying Bayes' rule and then asking which parameters W are most likely a posteriori. So under my prior and after I've seen my data. And let's try to work that out. Okay, so here's just base rule. That's basically the same formulas that we had written on the previous slide. Right? And what you want to do is you want to find the argmax of this quantity, right? You want to find the argmax over W of probability of W given x1 through n and y1 through n. Right? And so what is, um, so instead of taking, um, maximizing the posterior probability of W, I can try to maximize the log of that posterior probability, right? So I apply the log. And then uh, I can multiply by minus one in the set minimize, right? So this is just equivalent to arg min over W of um, the negative log P, right? Negative log uh, of P of W given X1 through N and y1 through n. Okay, so the same that we had done when looking at MLE for the maximum likelihood estimation for um, linear Gaussian models, right? And of course, we can just plug in 
this rule in here, right? So what do we get? Well, we take minus log of this whole thing, right? So minus log. Um, so we're going to get minus log of uh, PW, right? Minus log of Y1 through N, given X1 through N and W, plus log of the uh, denominator, which is given by this, right? So this is clear, right? So this is basically just the, the take what we've derived from using this rule as P of W given our data and take the log of that uh, multiplied by minus one and we get this expression here, right? Okay, so let's uh, do the following. So uh, inspect those terms. What is, uh, just look at the second term here, right? Does this look familiar? So what is this term? This we had already worked out, right? So this is just the log posterior likelihood of our labels, given the axis in W, under the assumption that, right, and which leads to this least square subjective, under the assumption that our labels are uh, independent, right? The label noise is independent. Okay, so this we already know, right? That's basically something like a squared cost. At least squares cost, right? That we, that we had derived before. Um, what is this? So this quantity on the right here, right? That's the log marginal probability uh, over y 1 through n, right, given x1 through n. Um, and how does this depend on w? Doesn't it all depend on w, right? So if I care about optimizing for the most likely parameter value w, a posteriori, right, I can forget about this quantity, right? I can forget about this normalization constant. Right, so let's just get rid of this. So this here does not depend, not depend on, on W, right? So this we can completely forget about. The second term we know, we already derived. So the main question is what's this, uh, the first one, right? So the log prior. So let's try out and try to work out the log prior. So what is this? So. Uh, log P of W. Okay, minus this, right? Is, is what? Well, log, it's a normal distribution, right? Um, let's just spell this out once more, right? Uh, w centered at mean zero, and the, uh, covariance matrix it's just diagonal matrix with beta square everywhere, right? So each coordinate is separately from each other, right? Um, which is basically, let me actually, okay. Let me do the following. So this is the, we said, right, the weights are all independent, right, across the dimensions. So I'll just plug this in here, right? So y equals one through n. Um, uh, each of them has a Gaussian distribution, sorry, D, right? So D dimensions, it's a Gaussian distribution centered at, uh, at zero with variance beta squared, right? That was our assumption from the previous slide, remember, right? So this is the, the assumption that we made here. Uh, so that we can plug this in. Let me, yeah, maybe let's do it in the next line here, right? So minus, uh, okay, log of a product, sum of the logs, right? The usual trick. 
So I get the sum over i equals 1 through d of log. And now I need to plug in the Gaussian density, right? So what is this? 1 over square root 2 pi beta squared, right, the variance squared, times e to the minus wi squared divided by 2 beta squared, right? It's just plugging in the Gaussian density. Right, very similar to what we had before. And now we have a log of a product, right, the log of the normalizer um, times uh, the uh, unnormalized Gaussian density, right, this uh, e to the minus w i squared, right? And this just gives the sum. This first term doesn't actually depend on i, so we just get uh, minus um, d times the log of uh, probably we need to spell this out more here, right? 2 pi beta squared um, plus sum over i equals 1 through d of w i squared divided by 2 beta squared, right? So this is basically just uh, using the fact that log and the exponential function cancel here, and then we have the minus and the minus, they also cancel, so I get, I get this quantity, right? So now what is this? Well, this is basically something, okay, something that's con constant, right? This first term here, right, that's constant with respect to w, plus 1 over 2 beta squared times the sum over the um, wi squared, right? And that, of course, is just the 2 norm of w squared, right? So that should look familiar, right? So uh, let's go back to our original problem, right? So if you now call this here star, right? Then star is basically the arg min over w of, um, of what? Well, we have the log prior, right? Which is, so again, I can forget about this constant here, right? Doesn't depend on, uh, so this does not depend depend on w, right? So again, forget forget about this part. So I have one over two beta squared times the sum of the squared weights plus the negative log likelihood of our data, and that we already had worked out, right? In the context of um, of the maximum likelihood estimate, right? So let's just go back a few slides and look up um, that formula, right? Which is basically this one here, right? So this is what we had worked out, right? Minus log of the probability of the labels given the inputs and our weights under the assumption that the labels are conditionally independent, right? Um, so basically we have independent label noise for each data point x. Uh, this basically gives us this term here. Um, Plus, uh, plus this scale d squared cost, right? And again, this term does not depend on, uh, okay, so I'll just spell this. Um, okay, so again, this does not depend on w, right? So we can forget about this. So what we have here is basically just <coughs> one over two sigma squared time plus the, uh, times the least squares cost. Right? I know this problem should look pretty familiar, 
right? That's nothing but rich regression. So this problem, again, what we can scale things a little, right? So this equivalent to argmin. And so what I want to do is I want to put this into the form um, lambda times the two norm of W squared plus sum over i equals one through n of yi minus w transpose xi squared for what is lambda? So in order for this to hold, right, I have to multiply um, by two times uh, sigma squared, right, and then collect the coefficient in front of the, uh, the Euclidean norm of w squared. So this is basically sigma squared divided by beta squared, right? Just collecting terms. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, it basically means that, I mean, this is rich regression, right? So it means that um, we can now understand rich regression as doing Bayesian inference, right? So this sort of magical sort of sum of squared weights that we had started with as sort of a penalty for trying to keep our weights small, actually now also has this nice probabilistic interpretation, right? If we basically make an assumption that our weights are Gaussian, and independent Gaussian across the dimensions, right, with constant variance, um, and our likelihood is Gaussian, right, with independent Gaussian label noise across all of our n data points with constant variance. And then basically finding the maximum a posteriori weights under that model, right? So trying to look for the weights, W, that are most likely a posteriori under our Gaussian prior under weights and the Gaussian likelihood on our data. These are really formally equivalent. So it means if you solve rich regression, you're doing Bayesian inference, right? So they're formally one and the same problem, right? So by solving this particular optimization problem, you're implicitly making this kind of probabilistic assumption. Right? And now one thing we can look at, so for example here, now this gives some meaning of the lambda, right? So how does the lambda scale? Well, lambda increases as sigma squared increases, which means, um, well, if I think I have more noise in my observations, then I better regularize more, which is pretty natural, right? So your lambda parameter should scale linear, so should basically scale linearly with the variance in your noise. Okay, so that gives sort of a nice interpretation of the lambda that you directly get out of this viewpoint. And similarly, right, um, it it's, it uh, decreases with beta squared, right? If I have a st more strong belief that my weights are close to zero, right, and I basically have a, a smaller variance. Uh, assumption my weights, I should use uh, a larger regularization parameter, which is very natural. Okay, so that's sort of how these parameters play together. Okay? Uh, good. So this is basically what we've derived, right? So you can view uh, rich regression as finding the map parameter estimate, the maximum posteriori parameter estimate for linear regression with these two assumptions, namely the noise is Gaussian, ID Gaussian, right, with constant variance, independent of the input, and independent across the data points. And the prior on the model parameters um, does not depend on the axis, right, then it's Gaussian. These are essentially the assumptions, right? And under those assumptions, rich regression basically finds the map parameter estimate, the most probable a posteriori parameter estimate, okay? And so this sort of, you can view basically, basically how essentially the Bayesian perspective of placing a prior on your weights allows to encode biases in a model that you, you look for, right? So you trade, trade bias, right, by sort of placing stronger Bayesian assumptions, sort of prior assumptions by regularizing more, you encode more bias in your model. But that can be very useful, as we've seen many times, uh, in terms of reduced uh, variance, right, and overall lead to smaller prediction error. Okay, 
Now, this perspective is extremely, extremely useful, okay, and much more general than this one slide. That's sort of the simplest case, right? So least squares regression is always our simplest examples and where you can illustrate things. Okay, so, so essentially, in many, many, many cases, you can view regularization through sort of a Bayesian lens, right? You make certain probabilistic assumptions on certain types of model parameters, right? Just as a particular choice of loss function corresponds to making some assumptions about the noise, right? About how the, the data, the labels are distributed, right? The randomness in our labels. Okay? So there's a much, much more general family of models, right? Where you would solve regularized estimation problems, where you minimize sort of uh, losses on your data plus a regularizer, and this corresponds to essentially doing inference and in some sort of probabilistic model, where you find, say, most likely parameter uh, values. Okay. So it's super, super useful. Right, because now explicitly you actually do try to model the amount of noise, right? And hence, consequently, the uncertainty in your prediction as well. Okay? Now one might ask, just as a brief outlook here, so we still find a single parameter vector w, right, through this perspective, right? You still estimate a single w. No, not the maximum likelihood estimation, but map estimation. But there's a whole family of, um, of approaches towards learning and prediction that we will not discuss in this class here, where you actually, instead of maximizing, so optimizing over W, you would actually integrate over W. So we'd simultaneously work with all possible models. Okay? So basically, sort of average with respect to the uncertainty that comes out of this model. And this leads, in this case of regression, to things like Bayesian linear regression, and to things like Gaussian processes, if you apply kernel methods, and so on. And these things are discussed in... Uh, in other courses and lead to a very, very useful family of methods that are not primarily based on optimization. So we take this very optimization-centric view to machine learning here, which is really very prevalent, but it's not the only viewpoint, right? So it turns out you can also use integration, and that's motivated basically through this probabilistic lens. That's sort of this very brief pointer here, right? Also a pointer to some of the, uh, the master-level courses um, that, that explore this viewpoint. Okay, but now let's talk about sort of some use cases here, right? So we said, now we have this nice interpretation of losses as likelihoods, right? And regularizers as priors, right? But now we can sort of start, well, try to understand what modeling assumptions you make and maybe changing these components, right? Changing these losses or regularizers um, to reflect different modeling assumptions. Okay, and so one question uh, that might come up is, uh, here is, so we talked about um, rich regression, and we derived that rich regression is basically Gaussian priors. Right? So if you use rich regression, you're a Bayesian, right? And you put the Gaussian prior on your weights. Right? Now, we also talked about that rich regression is only one form of regularization. There's many other useful forms of regularization, right? One famous one is the lasso. Right? Where instead of looking at the sum of squared weights, you look at the sum of absolute values of the weights. And we saw that this is super useful, for example, to do feature selection, right? Try to find sparse solutions. So now we can play the same game and ask, well, is there some sort of probability distribution, right, that this corresponds to? And in fact, the answer is yes, right? And it's the Laplace distribution, right? If you go through the same derivation here, right, um, as, we've, as we've done, then uh, um, basically... Similar to rich regression is equivalent to Gaussian priors in the weights. The lasso is, uh, is equivalent to replacing the Gaussian prior in the weights with the Laplace prior in the weights. It's a different uh, probability density function uh, plotted here, right? That looks like this. Uh, so basically here it also has the location and scale parameter, right? Mu and B. And uh, the density at X with parameters mu and B is given by 1 over 2B times E to the minus now, the absolute difference between x and mu scaled by b, right? b is sort of the standard deviation, right? Um, corresponding sort of to the, in the Gaussian case, right? Then mu is the mean, mean parameter. And that's the resulting PDFs. And what you can see is sort of the spike at zero, 
right? So it's, it spikes at zero, it's not differentiable at zero, um, whereas the Gaussian distribution is very smooth at zero, right? As so it means in the Gaussian prior, you don't really care if it's zero or epsilon, right? For some epsilon very close to zero. It basically behaves the same. But for the Laplace prior, it's not the case. Okay, so that's basically one uh, is sort of the natural probabilistic analog. But now you can actually go back and say, well, if I really want to have a probabilistic model of, um, uh, of sparse, uh, sparse data, is the Laplace distribution really the best distribution I should be looking for? For example, you could ask, well, suppose I do this random experiment where I actually draw my weights from a Laplace prior. You can ask, what's the probability that the resulting weight vector is actually sparse? And that probability is zero. Even though you have to spike at zero, right, you will actually never really sample the zero value precisely. Right? You'll always sample some value that's different from zero. So if you really sort of come from this sort of probabilistic viewpoint and you want to say, I really want sort of sparse, capture, capture sparse solutions, maybe the Laplace prior is not the right model. And there's other types of priors, like spike and slab priors and so on, right? that are basically mixtures of point masses at zero and some sort of nice density like a Gaussian density. And uh, one can sort of do inference uh, in these types of models. And that can give benefits in certain models. Okay, so that's, I will not discuss those here in much more detail, right? But this is sort of one perspective one can take, right? One can now really think about what is sort of a natural probabilistic model for sparse data. And then how would, would this translate to say an optimization problem I want to solve in the end to do my predictions. Okay, so same for likelihood. Uh, so we said um, if you do least squares, you think your noise is Gaussian. That's it, right? So least squares means you effectively assume that your labels are perturbed by Gaussian noise with constant variance. Okay, that may or may not be true, right? And so, in fact, there's lots of situations where it might not be true, right? And so, in particular, we had some similar discussions a bit earlier in this, in this course, right? One situation where it's not true is if you have outliers, right? So if you can have very strong outliers, outliers are extremely unlikely for Gaussians. Gaussians don't model outliers well, right? Everything that's sort of more than, whatever, two, three times your standard deviation of A is basically considered impossible. Because you have these double exponential tails. Right? So the probability of being far away from mean plus multiple times the standard deviation is effectively zero. Not exactly zero, but basically zero. That means if there's an outlier, it really, really strongly disagrees with your model and can really mess things up. So the Gaussian likelihood is not good if you have data that's perturbed substantially by outliers. <coughs> now, since you have this viewpoint, you can also say, well, if I assume that my data might have outliers, I might want to model my noise differently. Right? So, for example, I could look at the distribution of y given x that has heavier tails, right? that doesn't consider outliers impossible. Right? Meaning using heavy tail distributions. And one actual example is, uh, is the student's t likelihood, the student t distribution, in particular non standardized student t's likelihood, which looks like this, right? Also has a location and scale parameter, um, and it's given by this, right? So, so don't worry about the normalizer, this just has the job of normalizing to one, right? The main thing is this quantity here, right? So in a Gaussian, you have e to the minus the distance from the mean, um, right, uh, squared, right? So you look at the distance to your mean, maybe you scaled a bit by the variance, you, you square this, right? And you then exponentiate the negative of that quantity, right? <laughs> this is what sort of makes these tails extremely light. And here, instead of taking the exponentiated distance from the mean, you just apply some polynomial. Right? So for a Gaussian, so for a Gaussian, basically the probability that mu, um, sorry, that uh, uh, So just one dimensional, right? Um, y minus mu 
is greater than t behaves as e to the minus t. Okay, so basically the probability mass that's located in the tails, uh, okay, it's O of that, right? Goes to zero at exponentially quickly with t. But for, uh, for student t, the probability, right, of being more than t away from your mean goes to zero only at something like t to the uh, t to the minus uh, t to the alpha. Okay, minus alpha. Okay, so it's basically some sort of root, right? Because much less quickly, right? Not only polynomially, not exponentially. And this means that if you sort of look at the tail mass, right, something like this here, it's substantially bigger for student t. And if you really have outlier data, that can change things. So here's sort of data that I generated with student t, so heavy tailed noise. Sort of there's, there's the polynomial mean, and there's uh, now heavy tailed noise. Um, and there's two fits here, the, um, the red fit, which is the fits, the maximum likelihood fit, um, I get with the student t likelihood, shown here. And then there's the black fit, which is just the least squares fit. Okay, and the least squares fit is completely off. And the reason for that is that there's a bunch of outliers that don't fit on this plot here, right? So this is not data that I adversarially constructed, right? It's just data that where I sampled heavy-tailed noise. Okay, and there's not that many outliers, right? But a few, and they completely break this Gaussian likelihood assumption. Okay, so that's a good reason of why you might not want to use the square loss in some applications. Okay, and this probabilistic modeling perspective gives you sort of a natural, um, natural point of view, right, of, of maybe dealing with these sort of situations. Okay, now one thing is, um, so basically, um, right, so, so, so this is sort of, uh, we, we have said, so now you plug in the different likelihood, right, now the question is still, how do you actually obtain this sort of fit, right? How do you solve this resulting estimation problem? Any ideas? Right, I replace the Gaussian likelihood by the student t likelihood. Now, what does it mean? How do I actually solve the resulting learning problem? What would I do? Well, I look at my maximum likelihood estimate, right, or map estimate. So basically, I have my sum of the log likelihoods of each data point. And now instead of the Gaussian likelihood, I plug in the student t likelihood, right? Take log of this quantity, and that gives me a loss function, right? A new loss function that corresponds to the student t likelihood. Just plug that in, and then I train my neural net, my polynomial, my kernel method, whatever, with this different likelihood. Right? Now, it turns out this likelihood function actually is not convex, so the square loss is convex. This is not a non-convex loss function. But again, I mean, you're most of the time dealing with non-convex problems anyways, right? So usually it will sort of work fine. Or there's a chance it will work fine. Okay? <clears throat> Good. So this is regression, right? Um, now, the, so again, back to the beginning of the course, we started discussing regression, right? And then we moved on to classification. And we got to classification as basically just very similar to regression with two, uh, two differences, namely one of them being that in the end we optimize a different loss, right? We started with zero one loss, which was sort of nasty and for optimization, right? And then we ended up with the perception and the hinge loss for support vector machines, right? And the second was we actually didn't you, so we worked with linear models, so W transpose X, but we actually didn't predict W transpose X, but the sign of that, right, sign of W transpose X, which seems like a sort of somewhat arbitrary decision somehow, right, to take this continue valued output and binarize it somehow. Now the question is, does this probabilistic perspective have something to offer for classification as well? And yes, it does, right? So I want to talk about the natural model for classification. So the first question we might ask, is, well, if I take the perceptron, or if you take the support vector machine, right, the methods we've discussed so far that sort of came out of this 
optimization point of view, do they correspond to natural likelihood functions? And the answer is not really. So they are sort of not nice sort of probabilistic likelihood functions that sort of are associated with the support vector machine. Um, but there's different uh, likelihood functions that, uh, that one can use for classification. And the most famous of that is logistic regression. And the, way I, uh, the idea here is basically the, follow, uh, the following. Um, so if we think about what we do for least squares regression, then essentially what we do is we place this assumption that we have Gaussian noise. Right? We say our label Y is W transpose X plus Gaussian noise. Okay? Now for classic, right, so Gaussian noise is sort of a continuous distribution, right, places mass over, all over R. For classification, my data is binary, right, in binary classification, right, plus one, minus one. So we need a mo noise model for binary data. Okay, so now you can sort of take this viewpoint and say, well, let's look at different noise models that might explain our labels in classification and see if they correspond to a particular kind of probabilistic model and then derive a loss function from that. And that's the, the idea behind logistic regression. So what you're going to do is we're now going to model the class probability with the idea being that uh, essentially points very close to the decision boundary are uncertain versus very, uh, points far away from the decision boundary are very certain. So the idea being basically we sort of want to fit a classifier Actually, we want to fit a model of the class probability. So we basically want to fit um, to fit a probability of y, say p hat, given w, um, for y in plus 1, minus 1, right? Such that... Um, here, in this regime, the probability that y equals plus 1 given x and w is large, sort of is close to 1. Here, the probability of y equals minus 1 given x and w uh, is close to 0, and close to the boundary, the probability of y equals um, plus 1, given x and w, is, uh, say, a half, right? So, so I close to the boundary, I don't really know what's going on. If I go far away in each of these classes, um, then uh, I become more certain, right? That's sort of one way of modeling noise, right? Yes? Uh, this should be plus one, so yes, exactly, thanks. Okay, right, and now the question is sort of how to capture this sort of noise model, right? And one way to do it um, is basically to say uh, p hat of y given x and w, sorry, I model the probability of the positive class equals plus one given x and w. I just model this as the Bernoulli distribution, right? That's the probability of a coin flip with probability of heads, which are associated with plus one here, being given by some function on, how f on which side of the hyperplane we are on. Okay, so sigma is a function that looks like this, the logistic function um, that basically uh, starts off Um, so this here is W transpose X. This here is uh, sigma of W transpose X. And so here, initially it's zero, then it goes up to a half, and then it flattens out at one. Okay? So some sort of function that has this, this sigmoid shape. Right? So here the idea, right, again, this here is my W transpose X. So it means if I'm far in positive land, right, I have a, a positive number here, right, so this evaluates to something close to one, so I'm basically saying probability of heads is close to one, versus down here, um, this is gonna be very negative, right, so the sigmoid function is gonna be something close to zero, so the probability of heads is very close to zero, 
Okay? That's a particular noise model. Right? It's an assumption, a probabilistic assumption about the realization of this class label. Right? Similar to the Gaussian noise assumption, but now tailored to binary data. Okay? And so the particular link function um, that's used in logistic regression is this one, um, which is plotted here, which is given by uh, 1 over 1 plus e to the minus w transpose x. Right? So, or, so basically, really, just depends on the single input argument, right? Which is 1 divided by 1 plus e to the minus z. Right? And this exactly has those quantities, right? If, if these properties. So if z is 0, this evaluates to a half. If z is um, positive and large, right? e to the minus a positive large number is something close to 0, so the whole thing evaluates to 1 versus um, uh, versus if z is very negative, this evaluates to something close to 0. Right? So it's basically the same function you've seen as activation function in the context of neural nets. Okay? But now it's sort of used to model uh, activation probabilities. So class, class probabilities. Okay? So this is basically... Uh, um, So that's basically the assumption, right, behind um, behind logistic regression, right, that it's sort of like um, linear regression, but instead of assuming I have Gaussian noise, I assume I have uh, Bernoulli noise, right? So, so my, my labels are coin flips, independent coin flips uh, across the different examples x, right? Um, so independent across i, and uh, but not identically distributed, right? So if I'm close to the boundary, I have more uncertainty, right? My probability is closer to a half, then I'm very far in on the positive or the negative side. Okay? And now, uh, under this assumption, well, the question is, how can we go ahead and, uh, and on one hand side, estimate those parameters? And then, once you estimated those parameters, how do we actually turn it into a decision? Okay, and so the strategy we'll follow, right, is uh, we again use these estimation techniques, right, maximum likelihood estimation, map estimation, etc., to estimate the parameters that will yield an optimization problem that we can solve. And then later on, we need to make decisions, and that means we need to look at this randomness, right, in our, um, in our conditional distribution, and turn this into a discrete uh, fixed deterministic prediction. Right? And now, of course, so we derive for the square loss that the optimal thing to do is to predict the mean. Right? Here we have to see what sort of the optimal thing to do is. Right? It's, I guess, easy to guess, right? But, um, but that sort of just very, very naturally comes out of this model. But let's go through those details uh, in the next lecture. Okay? See you next week. <laughs>